Hello folks and welcome back. This is Johnny and this is Worktree Ironworks. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> Today we have Jim from the Crazy Viking Court. How are you doing today? Hello folks, Johnny here, and uh, welcome to a new series. I hope you like it. First, at number five, we have John Sylvester. John Sylvester was born in 1652. He was the Lord of Birthweight in Kexborough in the west of Yorkshire. He purchased his land from Francis Burdett in the late 16th century, and he worked as a blacksmith at the Tower of London, which you see here. The Tower of London was a fortress which was used as a jail and an armory. And John Sylvester is also credited with forging and constructing a chain blockade for the River Thames to prevent an invasion by the Dutch. Sylvester died on May 5, 1722 at the age of 70. Now I wasn't able to find much as far as uh, pictures go for John Sylvester, but I think this is about as close as we get. I don't know if it's the same guy or not, but as you see here, his name is Sir John Sylvester. And, you know, it's the only guy I can see at the time, so that might be him, it might not. We'll see in the future. But next, at number four, we have the legendary Japanese swordsmith, Masamune. Masamune was Japan's greatest swordsmith believed to have been working in the Sagami province during the Kamakura period, and was the father of Hikashiro Sadamun, who is also a legendary swordsmith. There isn't much recorded about the life of Masamun, but we do know in his lifetime he had trained many students in the secrets of his craft. He is also credited with making priceless swords, such as the Hanju Masamun, the Fudo Masamun, and the Musashi Masamun. He is believed to have lived between the years 1264 and 1343. Masamun is probably one of those smiths that we will do a future episode on. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Coming up at number three, we have John Fritz. He was apprenticed as a blacksmith starting at the age of 16. John Fritz was born on August 21st, 1822 in Pennsylvania. He was the oldest of seven siblings, the son of George Fritz and Mary Mayard. John would expand his profession and later become a mechanic and eventually work for the Cambria Iron Company in 1854, where he would design the three high rolling mill, the first of its kind. Several years later, he became the general superintendent and chief engineer at Bethlehem Ironworks in Pennsylvania. He was responsible for installing a Bessemer converter, a precursor to the open hearth furnace, it was the first inexpensive process for the mass production of steel from molten pig iron. John Fritz stayed with Bethlehem Ironworks for over 30 years, up until 1892. But come 1913, at the age of 90 years old, on February 13th, the man who had become known as the father of the United States steel industry would pass away. You can really tell that man led an interesting life and a very fulfilling life, possibly. You never know, but at number two, we have Sarah Kolnick. He's a personal favorite of mine, and I hope you really enjoy this one. Sarah Kolnick was a master blacksmith, born in Trabian, Austria in 1871. He grew up learning to forge nails in the smithy on his family's estate. He would become a journeyman blacksmith and travel around Europe at the age of 14 to learn the techniques necessary to master his craft. And then in 1893, Kolnick came to the United States to assist the German government in the metalwork exhibit at the Columbian Exposition, which was also known as the Chicago World's Fair. It was at this exposition where Kolnick would display his own piece of ironwork he simply named Masterpiece. Kolnick would win a medal for his work and recognition as a master blacksmith for his great display of skill on his masterpiece. But for Kolnick, the truly life-changing moment at the German metalwork exhibit was gaining the attention of beer baron Frederick Pabst. And it was at his suggestion that Kolnick had moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and set up a smithy. He employed many German and Austrian immigrants during his years, and they were responsible for decorating the city with many other great examples of masterful blacksmithing. Kolnick would go on to raise a family, and he worked in his shop until he retired in 1955. 
and on October 25th, 1958, Cyril Kolnick passed away. If you would like to know more about Cyril Kolnick, please check out the links down below. And now, a little call to action. And also, I just want to thank you for watching Wartree Ironworks, so make sure you like, share, and subscribe right now. It just takes a few seconds to smash those buttons, so go ahead and pause and like and share and subscribe this video and let me know what you think about it down in the comment section. I would also like to let y'all know that uh, we do have Walden Wire as of the recording of this little clippy here. So as soon as this is posted, I'm going to be working on the other videos. So stay tuned for that and let's get to number one. The legendary knife maker, born on May 1st, 1800 in Hackensack, New Jersey. James Black was a knife maker famed for his still very popular design for the American hero, Jim Bowie. James left home at the age of eight and found work as an apprentice silversmith. Not much is known about the next 10 years that I could find anyway, but at 18 years old, Black moved west and found jobs up the Mississippi River and eventually at the age of 20, he worked on a steamboat on the Red River in Louisiana and then settled permanently in Washington, Arkansas. He was hired by a blacksmith, William Shaw. Black would work on firearms and knives while William worked on shoeing horses and wagon wheels. Eventually, Black would become Shaw's business partner and go on to create many fine knives in his time with Shaw. But this wasn't the end of his story. Black would fall in love with his business partner's daughter, Anne. William Shaw was not too keen on this arrangement. And when it was known that Black and Ann Shaw would be getting married, Shaw ended the partnership and gave Black a note in compensation with which Black would buy some land, build his own blacksmith shop, a mill, and a dam along the Cassatot River. But this wouldn't last very long as Black and his soon-to-be wife would be thrown off their home, new homestead by local officials because the land had been claimed under a treaty with native tribes. This is when Black discovered the note given to him by Shaw in compensation for his partnership held no value, and so Black would return to town, open a shop in direct competition with Shaw, and come 1828, James Black and Ann Shaw would be married in spite of her father's blatant opposition. But Black Smithy would find success over Shaw's. He even had convinced his brother-in-law, William Shaw's son, to come work for him in his shop. And in 1830, Black would forge the famous design that we all know and love for the already famed Jim Bowie a knife fighter widely known for his 1827 sandbar duel and known today for the knife he used to kill three assassins in Texas, but it was in 1836 at the Battle of the Alamo that would cement Jim Bowie, his knife, and the man who created it as American legends. Black would go on afterwards for a short time to sell Bowie knives to Texas-bound pioneers because, in my opinion, everyone wanted to carry the legend of Jim Bowie on their belts. And still, in 2022, almost an entire bicentennial later, it's still up there as a legend and one of the greatest designs in history. And even more people want to wear the legend on their belt. Black died on June 22, 1872, at 72 years of age in Washington, Arkansas. He goes down as one of the greatest bladesmiths in history. He was also famous for keeping his process a secret by only forging his blades behind a leather curtain. And many have even said that Black had himself reinvented Damascus steel. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs>